All right. Um, <laughs> so over the next hour or a little less, we are going to, like Matthew Cobb, talk about something that, you know, people talk about when they're at university at 2 in the morning um, <laughs> after smoking a lot of weed and <laughs> maybe other stuff. Um, but instead of talking about aliens, we're going to talk about the self, this sense of a self that we have that I think has two strands. The first is that we are this unified thing that's distinct from the rest of the world, distinct from other people, distinct from the physical world, um, and with memories that's continuous, that are, that, that, so all of our memories make us continuous over time. So like the same me that, I didn't, that pulled down my bathing suit in front of my whole fourth grade <laughs> class for some reason uh, is, is the me right now. And so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it is this, uh, this sense that we're this little person behind our eyelids, behind our ears, this thing that's looking out into the world, having experiences, and it's happening to us. We're, we're, this is what philosophers, but apparently not neuroscientists, philosophers call the homunculus, like this little thing inside that's running the show, making decisions, and all the experiences that we have, all the perceptions that we have, it's happening to me. That's this sense of an I. And both of those things, but especially the second of those things, have come under attack from both philosophy and psychology. And so we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about what happens when these senses of self that we have dissolve, when they disappear, either through psychedelics or through meditation or maybe even through flow experiences like sports or um, playing music or something uh, along those lines. So I'm going to start with the philosopher because nobody ever starts with philosophers. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit about philosophers. <laughs> I, I think he made a joke in Bulgarian about philosophy, <laughs> but I don't even know what that was. So I'll have to find that out later. So I'm going to start with the philosopher. Josh, what is the philosophical conception of the self? Right. Easy question. Simple question there. That's good. Um, <laughs> but so central to uh, philosophical thinking, especially since Descartes, is the idea that there's some thing that's you that is the thing you know best of everything, that you know this m Everything else could be false. We could be in the matrix. We could be in the dream of an evil demon. But still, it would be you that's there. There's a me that says, oh, you know, maybe I don't look like this. Maybe I have a totally different body. Maybe I'm some octopus creature on planet Zepton. But I'm me. There's still a me, and I can't doubt that. Further, this, this me is, is unified. There, it's, it's a solid thing that Descartes didn't think could be broken into parts. He thought it was sort of, a, you know, th there's the you and it, it does things, it has memories, it lives a life, but it's you fundamentally. And that has shaped Western thinking about, about the self. Um, and that gives you the kind of dichotomy, this, there's me here and there's the world out there, and I wonder, is it real? And so, but, but there's the inner and the outer, the self and the other, the subjective and the objective. And the subjective has seemed to be the more solid. Um, that's the question that's coming up here today. The thing that you cannot doubt. That's right. The one thing you cannot doubt is... Right. That I'm me. I'm me. Because somebody has to be doing the doubting if right. you're if you're doubting. That's right. That's right. Um, now there have been from philosophers early on also did wonder about this. So famously, the philosopher David Hume, uh, Scottish philosopher David Hume, um, wondered whether there was this thing made any sense at all. And he thought, well, when I try to find myself, and I'm it's like trying to look at the back of your head, and it's not there. And so for him, you sort of had to see it to know it. And he never saw his, him, himself, and so he thought, look, all there is really is just I'm having experiences, I'm looking over here, I'm looking over there, but I never see me. And so he doubted that there was such a thing, but he was seen as a crazy Scottish skeptic. Um, and so the, the solid view in philosophy for what is that there is this thing, the self. Um, now, there's also this sort of the thing you talk about, the ordinary, everyday feeling we have of being 
I'm Josh. I'm still Josh. This, you know, maybe I didn't pull down my pants in fourth grade or whatever you did, but I've done some weird things, and that was me, yeah. and I'm here now. And, and so there's this thing that continues over time. Um, we like to use big words like diachronically. You know? So there's this long-term self that's me, and then right now there's the feeling, oh, yeah, I'm here. And both of those things are things that I think we're, are, are coming under pressure partly from neuroscience um, that we don't find that in us, in our brain when we look. Um, also, even in you know, regular life, you can have experience where it breaks down um, or it disappears or it fades. And especially if you enjoy or experiment with various kinds of interesting substances um, uh, of psychedelic nature, uh, you can have experience where the self really dissolves. Um, but this is actually a, a new way to do something that's very old, this sort of mystical experience of, of becoming one with everything or recognizing that really you are part of everything in some deep sense, and this idea of this dichotomy maybe was a mistake or, or an illusion. Um, right. And so those are interesting questions that we can try to get at with this science stuff. All right. So I think that's enough philosophy for now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is, maybe a little too much. What... Um, what is the, from the neuroscience or just scientific cons, uh, perspective, what, how does science view the self? Well, um, is my mic on, by the way? Everyone hear me okay? Yep. Uh, well, neuroscientists obviously are going to break this down into some very dry, annoying, not sexy uh, kind of definition of the self, which is, as neuroscientists, we're going to take a reductionist approach. We're going to look at what circuits are active when somebody is thinking about themselves, for example. What is it? How, how is it that this extremely complicated system that we have, our brains, how is that being synthesized together in such a way that we can have this sort of stable sense of who we are? And one of the most important aspects of this is really just us being in our physical bodies. I mean, we can all recognize at this point we are all in our bodies, we can feel our bodies, we can smell our bodies, hopefully not too much, <laughs> um, but that it's, there is so much information being processed by your brain at this very instant about where your body is in space. One of our most distinctive senses, which isn't talked about very much, is called proprioception, which is your brain being able to detect, to detect where your body is in space, because your being able to move would be irrelevant if you didn't know where you were starting from. So a massive amount of information is coming into your brain about that. There's also obviously information about kind of awareness as to what our breathing patterns are like, what the kind of quality of our thought is at the moment, what emotions we're feeling, and all these things tend to have kind of a correlation with one another. You know, oftentimes you'll see, I don't know, some guy trips over something and his head smacks onto the ground and you hear a predictable sound as his head hits the ground. That's something that we learn about this reality. That's not something that our brains are necessarily uh, like from a, a totally blank slate going to... It, it's, it's the repetition of that throughout our lives which we come to expect. And so that is what really defines our reality, us learning just millions and millions and millions of these tiny little rules throughout our lifetime which helps to build this sense of not just ourselves but what our reality is like. Well, presumably, so, just to clarify, presumably there are some animals who have a sense of themselves in space who can, will do predictable things when they fall who um, who have all the things that you're talking about, but don't feel from the inside that same thing that it seems like we feel like, this sense of a unified self, the sense of a little person dr running the show inside of us. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think you can, you can define the self as many different stages. So here right. we're talking about kind of our our homeostatic self, our who we are in physical space and who we are over time. And uh, one of the classical experiments being done by neuroscientists is self-recognition. So at what age, for example, will a baby be able to recognize that there's a little bow that they put on top of their head or a sticker on their forehead, actually, I think is what it is. The baby looks at themselves in the mirror. They, you know, around, I think, age 18 months, they actually start to recognize that their reflection is themselves and they'll reach for their own forehead to try to pick off that sticker right. because they've started to really establish that this is who, you know, they, they're recognized themselves enough to know that something is off. You know, that, that sense of self I think is different than the sense of self which can override like a psychological habit, for example. I think that's just kind of the next tier of consciousness, if you want to call it that. You know, that we are, uh, 
you know, if you talk, if you think about this term in terms of evolution, you know, we have a reptile brain, we're seeking sex, we're seeking food, we're breathing, we're shitting. You know, these are like our basic yeah. sort of... Reptilian fun. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then yeah. we'll slowly, 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 what separates us from just complete chaos is our frontal cortex, which is what is kind of keeping all this in check. It's where we plan, it's where we are kind of creating our... Uh, our um, how do I put this elegantly? It, it's, it's really the thing that is defining us from even higher primates, and it's giving this, this sense of consciousness and allowing us to kind of ponder these types of questions, I think, whereas uh, even a so, primate would not so, be able to. So there's, but, but higher primates can recognize themselves in the mirror. That's right. So the additional step is to be able to see yourself in the mirror and say, oh, I got to lose some weight or I got to... <laughs> right, yeah, and all and the, the terrible wow, things that I come Wow, I look good today, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, yeah, no, everything's great. This is, this is going well. Yeah. yeah, this is, by the way, why playing hide-and-seek with a two-year-old, they're not very good at it because <laughs> they don't have a sense that you can't see them when they're just sitting in the middle of the room. Louis C.K. <laughs> did a whole bit on this. Uh, and then once they get to a certain point where they, say, where they recognize that, oh, yeah, s I, they need to not see me for me to stay hidden, then they can play uh, without you pretending that you're not watch sitting them when they're in the middle of the room like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So somehow, uh, somehow in, in our development and also in evolution, this additional layer of self-awareness comes into being. And when we've got that, we can do all kinds of wonderful things. We can reflect like Descartes. We can look in the mirror and check out our look. Um, but interesting question, what is that? What, is, what has the brain done at that level? Uh, you know, it, what has it generated or figured out such that it's now able to play hide-and-seek better than a two-year-old? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I, I think that one of the things that our brains do very well is that, well, first of all, we have the, the outer cortex, which is doing many, many different things um, relative to what higher primates can do. But it's, it's really the synthesis of that information which is giving us a lot of this kind of capacity that other animals don't have. There's an area in the brain called the temporoparietal junction, which is about right here. Um, and many of you may have heard about you know, out-of-body experiences or something like this. I mean, when somebody would lose themselves. I mean, from a scientific perspective, it's easiest to study this kind of thing when it breaks. Um, so somebody's reporting that they're in, you know, their hospital bed and they're floating above their body. You know, what could possibly be causing that? Um, in this region of the temporoparietal junction, you have a lot of these different inputs which are telling you about where you are in space, which are telling you about what kind of where you expect to be uh, kind of conceptually as well. And just like you can have sort of distortions in your perception of your physical body, you can have distortions in your perception of your emotional self as well. Um, so what Don't happens always, is... always, pretty much? Uh, uh, yeah, I suppose <laughs> that's a good way to just sum it up. And uh, when, when you are in a position... So pretty much every time scientists observe this phenomenon where somebody is reporting an out-of-body experience, there's either a degeneration, a dysregulation, or a physical kind of disruption of this region in the temporal uh, parietal junction. To the extent that you can take um, this machine called TMS, transmagnetic stimulation, which is a little wand, which is like the most fun toy that has ever existed, <laughs> and you can put it on your skull in various places, yeah. and it's passing magnetic pulses through your skull and is able to disrupt the neural activity in very specific loci around your brain. Can, so you, can you get one of those on like the internet or something? On uh, like the that? black market. The black yeah, market, yeah. yeah. Okay. Deep yeah. web stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've got some <laughs> contacts for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so sure enough, you zap this region, the person starts to float out of their body. I mean, meaning that this sense of self is really kind of a, a fluid mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, another kind of cool trick that you can do, again, getting back to this point of us defining ourselves by the congruence of stimuli that we're seeing in our environments is put your hand up against, you know, a, a buddy's hand at some point. I'm not going to embarrass you all by forcing you to do this with your neighbor at the moment, but Josh and I will do this. Uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> right, and uh, non well, I didn't know that it was going to this place. Yeah. <laughs> this I'll do okay, you next, yeah, Josh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry. Um, so I'm going to now do this right here. So I'm, uh, on, on right. one hand, I'm, I'm kind of stroking this, very, this finger. Very wow. It's extremely yeah. sensuous feeling here. <laughs> 
And if you do this for a while, and you're, the, the visual input is very important, because yeah. this doesn't work as well when you're not looking, is yeah. it all start to feel as if his hand is my hand. That's weird. You can do this too, just with like a, a rubber works, hand. It on works the table. even better with your pants down. Like, <laughs> like in fourth grade. Neuroscience right? is really complicated about that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so even like a disembodied hand, like that's clearly cut off, just made of rubber, sitting in front of you. Somebody's doing this, like stroking the hand. You're looking at it kind of hypnotically. You'll start to feel as if that's your hand. Your your consciousness becomes decentralized. Um, there was a really cool and kind of famous experiment done by a, a great neuroscientist uh, in the States where, so some, um, I think this was being done on people who had lost limbs in war and uh, who had phantom limb syndrome, which is a pretty, you know, it's a pretty crazy thing. So you cut off the physical object, but you still have the, the neurological representation of your arm in your brain. And right. what sometimes happens to people is that you feel as if your arm is really just cramping up and it's just not stopping. And that feeling never goes away for years at a time. And so what they figured out is that if they set up this sort of mirror-like box, such that you can see, let's say this was, you know, you lost your right arm. You're putting your left arm into this box. You're seeing a reflection of your left hand on this side, making it, giving you the illusion that it's your right hand. And then you're just doing this. You're, ah. Oh, relaxing your left hand, you know, doing this sort of thing. And your brain, your stupid brain, <laughs> is tricked into thinking that it's releasing its right hand because all that neural architecture is still there. Yeah. It's just you have no way to access it unless you're kind of hacking it in a way. Um, so in these types of ways, the, the sense of self is uh, kind of manipulable and I think maybe that will... Yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, since you've brought up illusion and we met yesterday over beers, just not in front of 800 people. <laughs> and um, we were trying to pin down this question because there is a sense that the philosophical conception of self that we have, in particular that conception that we are this thing behind our eyelids, in our brain, behind our ears, a subject that experiences happen to, there is a sense as I understand it, both from a scientific perspective, but then also from certain religious traditions like Buddhism and Hinduism, that that self is an illusion or a, not an accurate reflection of what's going on. From the neuroscience perspective, there's nothing in your brain that could be that, that, that it feels like from the inside, that little guy or, or woman or whatever, <laughs> um, and <Them>. yeah, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but uh, but th there's no, there's no there's no possible way that the, the brain's not doesn't work that way. And then from the Buddhist or um, from the Hindu, uh, I I know a little bit more about the Buddhist perspective. They also believe that that is an illusion and they take steps to try to dispel the illusion. And now, and this is a fairly recent phenomenon, in science, uh, people are giving people psychedelics, mushrooms, um, acid, uh, the, what's the Peruvian one? Ayahuasca? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, DMT. Yeah, DMT, DMT. that yeah. breaks down the, that illusion of self. And I, I want to talk about two things. The first is the morality of that or the benefits of that, people report um, less, people, they use it on people with depression, they use it on people um, who have post-traumatic stress disorder, they, they, and then from the Buddhist perspective, the whole idea of trying to break this down was to eliminate all suffering. And so, so but setting that aside, what does it even mean for the illusion of self to break down. If I could report that I no longer have this illusion, then who's doing the reporting? What does that mean? What, who is that happening to if I no longer uh, have, if I'm no longer victim to that illusion? Hmm. <laughs> You're looking at me? I don't know. You're up, Josh. Um, yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. the interesting paradoxical question because we yeah. 
at least, you know, one of the things about it is we're deeply social animals, so the self-concept is, is a central part to how we interact with each other. So if that breaks down, it's just not clear how we interact anymore. And second, language, in normal language, the language of what we call reporting, where I report, oh, I'm feeling good, I'm feeling bad, or I'm seeing your shirt, it uses the, the you know, the, the I, the, the, uh, the I uh, representation. If that, the thing that that's picking out, we take it to be the self. So when I say I am sitting here, I'm talking about me. Now, if, if I say I am not here, that's the thing Descartes said you couldn't say. So, and yet we know from, from you know, reports of people under psychedelic experience or uh, meditative or religious experience or in other cases um, of, of disease or disorders where people uh, have breakdowns, they report I stopped being or I, and, and so it's very hard to know how to read that or to understand it. And yet, I think they're reporting something very real and very different. And so, um, this is one of the paradoxes or great difficulties of this, of this area, I think, for science especially. Whereas in philosophy, we can make up anything. Um, in science, as people have, you know, the earlier speakers have pointed out, you know, they need, they need actual rigor and stuff. So, it becomes difficult to know how to use those reports um, scientifically. So, anyways, that wasn't an answer as much as a, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> great, great. And <laughs> now we we'll turn to the scientists. You. Okay, science, you're yeah. on, right. <laughs> well, I mean, some of the things that I was talking about earlier are examples of how this, this self uh, is unstable and is, I, I mean, to a degree, really an illusion because what it is is this assembly of circuits that we all have, you know, that is kind of uh, what we define as ourselves. So what happens when you dis like dissolve those circuits? You know, you... you poke your brain in such a way that it's going to communicate in, in a different way that it's not used to communicating in. How is that going to affect your sense of self? Now, th there have been you know, quite a number of ex experiments done along these lines, and uh, one of my favorites was in the 50s, uh, this guy John Lilly, who's a kind of a, a fringe figure in neuroscientist, a, a really brilliant guy, um, invented the sensory deprivation tank that, that some of you might know about. Um, basically, it's just like a it's a big tank full of water. It's like this deep. It's super saturated with salt. And the water is skin temperature, and it's super dark and quiet inside. And the, the thrust of these experiments was just a very simple question. What happens when you remove all sensory inputs from the brain? Is, like, does a sense of self persist after that? Um, and, you know, of course, the, what really happened in this case, this was before meditation became more popular in the West, is that they started to come to some of the same conclusions that were coming at us, you know, particularly in the 60s from the Buddhist and Hindu traditions, which is saying that, indeed, once you get through the unstable self, which we would define as our habitual use of our brain circuits, and you get to the more fundamental part of ourselves, which is behind our senses, that's when you really start to get to what they would call our true identity. Um, and so what meditators do, you know, either in the sensory deprivation tank, which kind of aids in this process, or without, is it's a process of trying to consciously disassemble these circuits. I mean, there are many different, or just it, it's, it's the process of trying to shape your brain in a conscious way. There's nothing spectacular or magical about any of this stuff. Every single thing that you do makes some kind of a mark in your brain. You know, our brains are plastic. That's one of the things that's most cool about them. What meditation is doing is that it's allowing you this kind of conscious input into how I'm, what thoughts I'm going to kind of entertain and allow to make a deeper groove into my brain. Like, for example, driving here this morning, uh, three drivers at one stoplight cut me off. Thank you very much, Bulgarian drivers. You guys <laughs> suck. You suck. Be better. No, no. <laughs> um, you got to learn yeah. how to drive. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Um, is it, so it's like every time I get behind the wheel in Bulgaria, it's just like, uh, you know, I'm just training that. It's war. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Training that, that fear response, you know, it's, it's uh, and it's digging that groove deeper and deeper into your brain such that now I just see a car and I'm just like, ah. <laughs> um, so how can you make a conscious, and that be, that's becoming myself when you think about it. I mean, that's kind of integrating itself I into me. How do you disassemble that? Well, you habituate the response. If you sit still for long enough or you dream or whatever it is, 
those types of thoughts or emotional kind of waves are going to come over you, and you can make the conscious choice as to whether or not I'm going to engage with the thought, allow the emotions associated with that memory to continue to go through my brain, or I'm just going to see that it's happening and I'm going to let it go, and I'm going to focus on just remaining calm. So that's kind of the process about disassembling these habitual circuits in order to get to that deeper part of the self, which is which a is far real. more difficult thing to define, I think. But real. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. So we were told um, by Lubo that nobody in Bulgaria meditates. Is that true, by the way? How many people here meditate? Raise your hand. It's a lot to, uh, every night. There yeah, you nice. <laughs> Look at this. See? Uh, <laughs> in any case, a lot of people don't uh, <laughs> everywhere, not just Bulgaria. And what's really interesting about the psychedelic research is that you can have some of these same experiences. If you don't feel like sitting for a half an hour or an hour every day and, and meditating, you, there's a big shortcut here, right? <laughs> you can yeah. take shrooms, you can take acid, wh uh, whatever the... Now, that said, all of us here have done psychedelics uh, <laughs> multiple times, yes. but uh, Josh and I have not really experienced what I could describe as a loss of a sense of self. There's a lot of other cool shit that's going on, <laughs> but not a loss of a sense of self. As I understand it, you did have that uh, experience. I, don't, I still don't know who I am, dude. Yeah, okay, right. Um, let, let's, let's like lay some groundwork for, I guess, just what the mechanism is on yeah. how psychedelics work and how they kind of get you to this crazy place. Um, psychedelics, at least the classical psychedelics that I'll talk about, are psilocybin, uh, LSD, and DMT. And all of them are closely resemble a molecule called serotonin, which is a, a common neurotransmitter in our brain. So if you have two neurons, I mean, we have you know, many billions of neurons in our brains, you got neurons that are connected up to one another through their connection called the synapse here. So let's say a signal is coming down this neuron and it's wanting to make a connection to this neuron. Many different types, there, there are, I have to say too, there's many different types of synapses, but we're only going to talk about the serotonergic ones at the moment. So this one, the signal comes down, an electrical current comes down. It causes little packets of this molecule, serotonin, to be released into the space between these two cells. They diffuse across that space and then they bind to these serotonin receptors, of which there are probably 10 different types, on what's called the postsynaptic cell. That receptor then changes its conformation. It opens up a channel in the membrane and allows ions to come into the cell and to change the electrical potential of the receiving cell, which then causes it to fire its own action potential. And this is how kind of the chains of electrical activity are happening in our brain. So really everything that we're doing, and, and serotonin, I should say, is particularly involved in mood and emotional and, and movement regulation. Um, so this is happening many, many billions of times in our brains kind of at all, at all times. So what happens then if you're going to take a molecule like psilocybin or DMT or LSD, which looks like serotonin, it has molecular features like serotonin, and it binds to some of these receptors even more strongly sometimes than serotonin itself. But you're taking this systemically, like you're, you're putting it in your stomach, and then it's just diffusing wherever it's going to go. It's not like it's being actively transported to the right place to give you a specific thing. It's causing your neurons to fire in a noisy way. It's diffusing into all of these synapses, and based upon the, the kind of kinetics of how this is happening, it causes activation of these, these cells in, in, a, in a specific way. So um, there's a paper that came out a while ago which I think defined this spectrum of consciousness in a really elegant way, which is a more open type of consciousness, like you might expect in, in somebody with a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia, or in a child who does not have a very defined sense of self. You know, there's the, the, the brain is wide open to possibilities. There's not a lot of kind of habitual uh, 
circuits that have been programmed into it yet. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, you have things like obsessive compulsive disorder or depression or anxiety, are these thoughts that you're just constantly ruminating on that dig these really deep grooves into your brain that your consciousness tends to kind of dip into. What these psychedelic drugs are doing is that they're shifting your brain more towards that open state. They're adding noise into the system such that when you're taking a low dose of a psychedelic, everything looks pretty much the same except your eye is like dripping off of your face a little bit. Right. You know, <laughs> it's like there's like s these slight distortions that start to happen. I'd call that more is, than slight. Yeah, that's yeah. maybe <laughs> I've gone a little too far there. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> um, when you take higher and higher doses, your kind of your brain starts to fall apart in a sense. Your sense of reality starts to fall apart because your normal way of synthesizing the world gets infused with so much noise that you're unable to maintain this sense of reality. And it's activating all of these types of circuits that otherwise would not be activated. Um, and I should say that this research is in its infancy. At least the, the formal neuroscientific research has, is in its infancy. These substances have been used in many cultures for thousands of years. I mean, the, the cultural approach to this is very, very well established. Um, but only two years ago, they did just the basic experiment of giving somebody acid and putting them in the scanner and seeing what's happening just all over their brain. And the results of that experiment was that there's just more brain activity all over the place that's kind of indiscriminate almost. Um, so Holy shit, I'm taking acid in an fMRI machine. Yeah, right. That's the <laughs> signal of what that is. <laughs> yeah, your mind is yeah, like not, blowing out. It doesn't sound like the best place, <laughs> but you know. Yeah. Um, so upon, so uh, cutting the chase, getting yeah. to the really, really high doses, yeah. it, that's at the point that you have just totally overridden any of your like normal circuitry. I should say, interestingly, because these drugs are not touching the very basic elements of how our brain is communicating for breathing, you know, or for like maintaining muscle tone, you know, it, it, they're very safe. Like people don't die from these. You don't stop breathing when you're using them because these neurotransmitters are not underlying those types of things. Uh, but everything else goes completely nuts and you, you enter a space that is void of anything that is recognizable in any way whatsoever. In incl and, including that it's you? So I'll, I'll <laughs> say this, I'll say this for myself, but this, my, my voice is one amongst the chorus of many, uh -huh. which is that the feeling of being there is the most familiar and comfortable in a way feeling that you can have. Interesting. There's, there's a very deep, distinct feeling that you have always been in that place and that you will always be in that place and that your consciousness has always existed outside of your body. And you know what? I cannot tell you if that's because I've just put a whole shitload of drugs in my brain <laughs> or right. if there is actually some kind of reality to it. Right. And you know what? Like, neuroscience is never going to answer this question. Right. So can you... Cl what does it mean that your consciousness is outside of your body? What do you uh, mean when you say that? Well, I, I, maybe it's more accurate to say that I, you don't feel as if you have a body. Like, that your consciousness is dimensionless. Do you feel like there's no distinction between your body and the rest, the, your perceptions? Is yeah. that the idea that that distinction breaks down? Yes, that the way that our brain organizes things in traditional reality is through kind of a dualistic approach. I mean, your yeah. brain is a contrast detector. That's what it's the best at. Your brain's not so good at being able to tell precisely what the temperature is in this room, but if the outside is one degree cooler than it and you go in there, your, your brain's gonna immediately react to that contrast. So when you're breaking down its ability to detect contrast, then you're left with a space of, I mean, the, the Buddhists or the Hindus would call it non-dual reality. Like there's no distinctions between anything. There's, there's no dimensions, there's no measurement of any kind, including time in that space. Including time. Yeah. yeah, maybe we won't go down that road <laughs> un if, unless we have uh, the thing that doesn't exist. But um, <laughs> the, I, I wanted to ask you why, because now this has been floated over the last few years in scientific communities and in uh, clinical psychology as a way for treating depression and treating other kinds of mental disorders. Why? What is it about 
dissolving that the, the ego, the ego dissolution that is, would make it effective at treating those kinds of disorders. Yeah. Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. So this is, this, these are basically kind of questionnaire-based studies. There's, there's not a lot of, yeah. yeah, unfortunately humans are inconvenient to study. Uh, like you can't just <laughs> cut their skull open. Yeah. It's, it's very unfortunate. Uh. But the types of the types of interventions that you can do, sticking somebody's head into a uh, like an fMRI scanner, that that data is just like painfully low resolution. It's not really telling us what's happening at the level of the synapse, which is the most important thing here. Um, my gut on it is that the sen so the loss of the sense of self is correlated with a very high amount of this noise being in the system. And I was trying to establish earlier that when you have these types of repetitive thoughts or you have or post-traumatic stress disorder, you have a very traumatic experience. Oftentimes when you have a very emotional experience, that memory gets encoded very, very strongly, like very deeply and fundamentally into your brain. And those types of memories are very hard to dislodge. So if you're gonna do this uh, kind of uh, pharmacologically by putting a drug into the system and adding noise and forcing that circuit to not work for a little while, then with a therapeutic approach as well, you're, you're talking over the experience with a, with a trained therapist, hopefully, you know, and that's, I personally advocate that, you know, th these are not toys. You're, you're a drug dealer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bruno. Or just. I feel weird, the, Bruno. Yeah. I feel really weird. Dreams, yeah. <laughs> um, but so I think that the, the, I'm not sure that it's causative that because you're losing yourself and you're having a dissolving of the ego, that it is improving these as much as it is, it's a consequence of the drug being in your brain and helping you to disassemble the circuit right. such that when you are re-encoding the memory, because your brain does this, every time you remember something, it gets labile, it's flexible again, and you re-remember that memory with the emotional context that you have at the moment and the memory gets re-encoded which is why memories are just like notoriously terrible uh, and unreliable, particularly like in, uh, you know, in law, for example. So um, that's what I think is, is happening. Is, so, so you, just to make sure I understand, you have these memories or these patterns, these destructive patterns that are in the brain and in your mind and the psychedelics just through all the flooding of all these other things, disrupt the patterns, and that's exactly what we need. Yeah, it's kind of like the reset button. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can kind of imagine what's happening if you're pushing that reset yeah. button every day. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like yeah. you're, there's some serious danger that can be done, right. and not everybody should be taking these for sure. Yeah. But at the very least, you know, we need to be investing more time and money uh, and and research into this field. So. The other thing that is reported, and this is maybe more in the Buddhist, but also this comes up in the psychedelic literature, but especially the Buddhist meditative mindfulness, uh, is this idea of an increased sense of compassion for the, the world, this sense of, um, yeah, uh, that you're a better person. And it's not obvious why that would be the case. Why the fact that you're breaking down your sense of you and this distinction between you and, and other people, why that would lead to greater compassion for others, for the rest of the world, for strangers, for, for, for animals, for... So what's... I mean, I, I have some thoughts on that, but I'm curious as... Well, maybe let's start with Josh. Yeah, yeah. We haven't heard from Josh in a while. I mean, my, my thinking is maybe this is sort of, sort of, I don't know, I should say individualistic Western kind of concept of self. I wonder about, I was going to say, I wonder about societal, uh, cultural differences in these things. Like, so how different is uh, the self-concept across cultures? Um, but um, just from my perspective, um, you know, uh, generally I think about myself. I think, what do I want to do? And what about me and my stuff? And, then, and, and so to the extent that this 
undermines that approach or that kind of way of thinking, that would lead me to think about others. And so, I don't know, you know, it's not 100% reliable that I would start, you know, being compassionate per se, but at least I'm no longer simply focused on me and what I want. I might sort of now recognize the interconnectedness that I didn't see or begin to see other perspectives that I didn't see. So that seems reasonable to me. To just get out of your own head. That's right. You just notice this world around you, and, yeah, right. and, and 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 you don't think that that boundary is as strong as it was, and so so now you really do feel like, oh yeah, we're kind of in this together. Or at least that's one way to think about it. Hmm. Without even like holding hands, like you guys were doing, stroking before. fingers, yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can do that too. We'll hold hands yeah. later, man. <laughs> yeah. No, I guess. Uh, yeah. So what what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I don't think that that. Uh, like clinical neuroscience has answers to this. I mean, it's as much as a mystery to, to me as you guys, so I'm just going to wildly speculate also, yeah. uh, which is... Welcome uh, to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I find just completely crazy and fascinating is that this state of mind which is described by very experienced meditators, I'm talking about people who sit in a cave for like 40,000 hours of their life, 40,000 hours. That is a state of mind that really none of us are able to relate to. I mean, uh, that, that degree of training is, is extreme. That the state of mind that they describe in that thoughtless existence, that one-pointed, non-dual um, kind of ecstasy, many of them would describe, has a hell of a lot in common with how people describe advanced psychedelic states, which also has a hell of a lot in common with people who suffer grand mal seizures, the, the, the type of seizure which knocks you off your chair and has you writhing on the ground for you know 15 minutes or something like this. Uh, epilepsy, by the way, is when you have an epileptic seizure, you have the, the focus of the seizure, which is the place where the neurons start to communicate in waves. So normally your you know, neurons are having this very kind of complex circuitry, which is communicating in a very specific way. And then in epilepsy, they start to all just kind of have this wave-like activity. So you're basically wiping out all of the distinct neural activity which is giving us, you know, the ability to do all the things we do. Um, so when these seizures spread over the entire brain, they go through the corpus callosum, they're affecting both hemispheres. These people writhing on the ground that everybody around them is going like, holy shit, like get a doctor immediately. They wake up oftentimes and will describe the experience as being profoundly ecstatic and that it was amongst the most meaningful uh, and incredible experiences of their lives. So, but that's a little different than also feeling a kind of closeness with others that you didn't feel before. Well, I, yeah. I mean, the, so the, the Buddhist and the Hindu traditions, and pro I'm less familiar with the Christian traditions, I think would define the, the baseline state of mind as being one of joy and ecstasy and compassion for fellow beings. And this information is telling me that maybe there's some degree of, of truth to that. I mean, the other, um, <coughs> it's going to come up with another example. Anyway, it slipped my mind. Wait, what, what would tell you that there's some sort of truth to that? Well, that, that's when you are, so all of those states are characterized by a lack of thought, if you want to think about it. I mean, one way you're just, two ways, the, the epilepsy and the psychedelic drugs, you're hitting your brain with a friggin' sledgehammer. I mean, you're just annihilating everything. Meditation is the more kind of comforting and slow approach to that spot. Um, but the end point of all of those, even though you're converging on that from very different methods, is that same type of space that people describe as being, feeling one with the universe and feeling, you know, profound joy and appreciation for those around you. So one worry you might have, and I think this is a similar worry that, that I have sometimes with Stoicism and philosophy, the Stoic tradition, is this idea of di diminishing personal attachments, which might naturally come when you diminish your attachment to yourself and who you are, but also your relationships with other, with other people, that and now you feel this kind of universal compassion, is that desirable? Is that something we would want? Do I want to view my daughter in the same way that I view strangers across the globe who I've never met? Is there something that, and so if you're embarking on this path, is that something that, to actually worry about that you will become less close 
with the people that you're currently close with. And especially if those are the kinds of the relationships, those are the kinds of um, experiences that provide so much meaning to life, so much of what I take in part to be grounding morality. And now all of a sudden, so there's a sense in which if you love everybody, you love nobody. You know, um, that's profound. Dude. Uh, <laughs> I know. I, I need to, but so I don't. So is that a worry that you take seriously? That it, this diminishing of personal attachments um, might lead uh, at the or, or yeah, this developing of universal compassion will come at the expense of diminishing personal attachments that are deeply meaningful to you. Uh, I mean, I haven't had the, the profound experience uh, like that, you know, to the point of really loving everyone. But my, own, my, <laughs> you know, I hate a lot of you guys. But, but, but I mean, my, my guess yeah. is from, from what I... You don't I, love, like, hardly anybody. That's right. Yeah. But, but, but my guess is it doesn't, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is just, you know, the pop Buddhism that I know about. In the it doesn't have that effect. It's, it's not like... You, you, you love your daughter less. You just love everyone else more. I, I mean, so it, I don't see why it needs to be a zero, it's not a zero sum game. It's, you know, can't you just increase your love and love more than just the couple of people, you, you know? And so, and also maybe you begin to love your daughter in a different way, you, you know, it, it, as being part of this, sorry, that's getting weird. Uh, uh, maybe you love the, the, you know, those meaningful connections you have become equally important in some way. You're the guy who took off your pants in fourth grade. It's not me. Um, That's a memory I'm trying to... Uh, <laughs> hey, these, these are the pathways hey, you've laid down. Yeah, right? so, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, get, I get the worry that, that somehow this universalism will, will diminish the local connections that you have. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I haven't... I'm not a 40,000-hour Buddhist monk in a cave. But you have a lot of experience with this. Is that something that... I mean, you have a lot of experience with the meditative and... Tradition is that something that you see in the people that you've been in contact with? Less personal, meaningful personal relationships. I don't think so. I think there are some people who put on that air because they're like trying to show everybody how advanced they are. Uh, <laughs> but I think yeah. that the what what really happens is you just become more comfortable in your own skin, like that your your own innate personality traits become kind of honed and refined and, and balanced more towards the positive. I mean, that, that's what I've seen, I guess. I agree with Josh, too, that I don't think that the end state here is that you are this, uh, you become a computer, basically, which is, I mean, yesterday we were talking about what, I mean, what are the ethics of if your ethical approach to the world is one of utilitarianism, which is in optimizing the way that sh your morality works such that you try to bring about the most good for the most amount of people, in which position I think you, you pose the, the potential, am I going to withhold treatment from my daughter for some reason because it would benefit a thousand other people in, in another way? I, I just have, I have no idea, you know, how that equation would kind of play out for somebody who's that far along. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 I wonder about this, especially at, at the very least, it does seem like the ethical ideal. It is for Stoicism. It does seem like it is for Buddhism. It does also kind of um, fit with the metaphysics of it. Why should you have a personal attachment when you're not even a you and they're not even a them <laughs> uh, and there's really just one thing, yeah, right. what, it doesn't even make sense to have a personal attachment, or does it? And is that oversimplifying or caricaturing? Well, um, again, like I, I get, all I can speak from is just how they would describe the state of mind and from what I've read from, from yeah. very advanced meditators, which is that they just simply recognize that our consciousness is part of a shared consciousness and that being compassionate and loving to anybody benefits you and makes your own life enriched as well. Do you love your kids? No. No, that's, but I'm just trying to show how advanced I am. Yeah. That's right, that's right. There's, uh, a, there's, a, wait, there's a country music song yeah. that says, I love everybody, especially you. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's what, yeah. I mean, there's also this other element where you can focus more on other people when you're not focused on yourself when you're yeah. not self-obsessed. Right. And yeah, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and that would be a big positive, actually. And yes. Uh, well, one thing I will say, actually, about after having kids, you know, having a five and a two-year-old, that so much of your love and attention is focused on them that I, c I really sort of feel like I have less of that to go around, in a way, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the monsters are sucking you dry. Yeah, yeah I have kids too. Yeah. I know how it is. I mean, it's like <laughs> kind of the reality of the situation. So if there's a way to kind of fill the vessel more full so that there's more of it to go around, that, that yeah. seems to me to be, I mean, only a good thing. Put them in a car, take the emergency brake off, you know, they go into the lake. Yeah, that's then kind of what, that's what we're saying. Then there's more love to go that's around. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Um, can I, say that, I mean, one of the yeah. interesting things that's coming out of this for me, uh, back to some of the issues about synapses and cell, is, is the, what we are, are are these series of patterns that are laid down in the brain. Uh, and that's kind of like, like some of those are sort of what we are, and that's what neuroscience at least suggests maybe in one way, that you are this sum of these synaptic patterns. But we can, with these methods, um, alter those patterns. Um, and to me, that's enlightening. Like, so, so the, the science can show you um, you know, under the right conditions, ways to, to alter yourself. Now, what the goal state should be, that's a philosophical question. That's a tough, you know, it's a difficult question. But, but there is, there's this interesting ways to get in there and mess with the self and maybe alter it for the better and hopefully not for the worse um, because we kind of have some understanding that, look, somewhere in those patterns of connections at the cellular level, that's you, you know. Now, you know, that to me is a, a neat thing to learn from, uh, from the neuroscience stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it you know, when it comes to the, the psychedelic interventions, too, w one thing that, uh, again, I just have no ability to explain, but which is highly fortunate, is that, uh, so there was a, one of the first papers to come out about this at, at uh, Johns Hopkins. It was about 10, 15 years ago now. They gave psychedelics in various doses to naive folks, like people who never tried it before. And they started with a low <laughs> dose, they gave them a high dose, they weren't telling them what they were giving. And then at the end of this... <laughs> IRB. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, at the end of this, this trial, they would ask them, how would you rank this experience amongst the most important in your lives? And it was something like 85 to 95% of the people in that study ranked the high doses of psychedelics as amongst the most important experiences they've ever had in their life. Yeah. Um, even those who had a terrible trip, because that happens. You know, yeah. it amplifies what's in your brain. It forces you to confront. Donald Trump would have the worst trip <laughs> in the history of the universe, <laughs> How, <laughs> which is my solution to the problem. How can we run that experiment? Yeah. Uh, Someone just needs to drop a little. So yeah. Speaking of bad trips, and uh, <laughs> there's there's research both on the meditative side and 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 on the certainly on the uh, psychedelic side that people do have really bad trips. That it's terrifying uh, what happens to them. Why do you think that is? What's going on in the brain that's different from these ecstatic experiences or these feelings of deep ecstasy and, and compassion? And what I've found is that the bad part of the trip is typically transient, like that it's a path to get to the part which is where you've kind of gotten through this. Uh, because, I mean, one thing that's, that's pretty intuitive is that when your reality as you know it completely dissolves around you and you don't even know who or what you are, that's pretty freaking terrifying. So that, that ends up being a lot of it. Like the loss of control, I think, is in and of itself the therapeutic aspect of it, and it's bloody terrifying. Um, so that, that's one part of it, but I also think another part of it is that you, if you have these traumatic experiences in your life, things that, you know, your regrets, you know, we all have something like this, that oftentimes that that will come into your consciousness and you're just gonna have to deal with it. Or if you're in a situation where it's, you're not feeling terribly comfortable, and this is another reason why. Like now. Yeah, like <laughs> if I was tripping right now, it probably wouldn't be very good. Um, but that, that it'd be done in a therapeutic and comfortable setting right. so that you're, because it's just gonna amplify whatever is, is happening to you. Yeah. Right. And you have had, do you wanna uh, talk about your bad trip? <laughs> I guess I should have cleared this with you before, but... Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's all right, we'll, we'll go there, I guess. No, I mean, it was, it's basically that, like, that was the, the, the meat of it, you know, just yeah. feeling as if um, you are, you don't exist, that, you know, your entire life is an illusion, you live in, like, not just the matrix, but the evil matrix, and that you will never 
emerge back to yeah. a, a reality that you can understand again. I mean, that that really was the the core of it. But then working through it, and, and uh, the point I had wanted to make about the, the Johns Hopkins study too is that when a lot of the folks were interviewed about their bad trips afterwards, I forget if it was the same day or the day after, and they reported, you know, it was a terrible experience and would never want to do it again. And then they were interviewed six months or a year later, they reliably reported that that bad experience ended up transforming their lives for the better. I mean, like across the board. So it's it's not necessarily fun, you know? Right. That, that's something that I think a lot of people don't really grasp about. This is not something that you, d you, like you eat a bunch of mushrooms and you go to a rave or something. A lot of people do that, and I think it's probably not for the best. <laughs> um, but yeah. anyway, the, the, um, thankfully, for whatever reason, the output of this experience is pr pretty much across the board good, unless you have some kind of a psychological tendency toward being too far on that like noisy consciousness side of the spectrum because it can push some people permanently over into that sort of psychotic state, which is obviously not good. Yeah. Right. Um, all right, well, one more question, I think. <laughs> yeah. Flow states, we haven't really talked about flow states, but I think almost all of us have been in an experience where we're so into what we're doing that we really do lose that sense of self in a, in a way that seems very similar to what you're describing and in a way that is, seems uniformly positive. It's something that we love. It's something that we don't get enough of and that when we're in it, it's not, again, we're not, we, we are not even aware of that we're in it. We're aware of what we're doing. We're so focused on what we're doing, but there's something really just fulfilling about that. Is that, are, are, from a neuroscience perspective, is that the same kind of thing that's happening and just from an experiential perspective, is that? Yeah, um, I don't know what the data looks like from uh, um, like on flow state specifically, like brain, I, I think that brain scans would be pretty hard to do in that state because the second you have that's that like, point. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, we were talking yesterday that, uh, you know, Josh, the musician getting in that flow state, you know, jamming, yeah. I mean, why don't you talk about that a little right. bit? So, I mean, so when it's going, I mean, I play guitar and I play in bands, and when it's going right, um, you, you really do stop. It's something else. Is, you, you go somewhere else, and you can feel it and sense it, and the band can sense it. it just, there's a kind of thing that happens, and then you're, you're able to just, it's just effortless. And, and, and it's, but it's not that you're, I'm not aware, um, it's, you know, but, but, it, but it's sort of, it's a different kind of awareness. And it is, yeah, and it is, there's something about, and this is where I think there's some similarities. Where it, it's a kind of harmony. Um, there's a kind of uh, melding with others in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess you can, you know, there's, you know, this is a case where it's with other people, so that happens. But even in, in things where you're just doing something yourself that you get into the state, you really do become, as it were, one with the thing you're doing. Um, and, and, and there is a kind of, yeah, the, the, there is a kind of disappearing of the self, and, I, I, you know, and, and it's greatly pleasurable. Yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing that, yeah, that's why I, I love playing music for that reason, and, mm -hmm. and I'm sure everyone, most people have some hobby like that, that, that sports, very deeply... Sports, it can be right, sports, sports, it can it, be, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can, writing sometimes, but almost never. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Um, well. Uh, yeah. I just want to say ahead. one thing yeah. about that, sure. which is that, um, I mean, when you lose that, that's when you have that, like, the second you are evaluating the yeah, state right. of mind is the instant that it's gone. It, it dies. So annoying. That's right. That happens all the time in meditation, too. You know, you reach that, the time when you meditate, too, you reach those states of flow where your, con your like, concentration is kind of effortlessly maintained. And then you're like, wait, what am I doing? Like, I got to go to the supermarket tomorrow. And then all of a sudden it's gone. Or you go like, I did it. I reached yeah, the yeah, state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, that, yeah. that just fucks <laughs> it up. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that just see, it just like you said, our patterns are to be constantly assessing what we're doing and how it's looking and what, like, what go are we reaching a goal and what, and I, I paradoxically, the goal is to not be thinking in those terms. I, and one thing that's really interesting is in short-term meditators, the frontal cortex is more highly active because there's more of this top-down kind of control. Oh, my mind's drifting out of bring it back. Drifting, bring it back. Just over and over and over and over. And as the meditator gains more experience, you see less activity in the frontal cortex, indicating that maybe these states of ecstasy are inversely defined from 
what makes us human. You know, it's like right. our right. frontal cortex is the thing that is separating us from animals, and it's the thing that's making us freaking miserable all yeah. the time. That's right. And it's and thing that's making my dog so happy is not <laughs> worrying about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, we need to get get back to our reptilian selves. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. All right. Well, this is flashing and a. In a scary way, so <laughs> I assume we're we're out of time. We were gonna also solve the problem of free will, but we'll yeah. save that for another time. Another day. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat>